I have the blade all rough ground and uh, ready for handle fitting. So we're coming over here. And uh, luckily I just had a friend um, another knife maker from nearby dropped over and traded me some blocks so now I got some cool material to work with a little bit better than what I'd had on hand I wanted to do stabilized box elder on this one and uh, I really like flashy green double die quite a lot but that's not really the look I wanted for this knife and then he also had this really cool, like, black and cream color sort of double die box elder. And, uh, and as soon as I saw that, I was like, oh, man, I need to put that on the keyhole. So I'm going to use this block. And then uh, what I've done is I like to work from a pattern on handles because I prefer you know, drawing things in to get them to look right on paper rather than like just kind of going at it willy-nilly freehand a lot of the time on the grinder. It's very easy to erase lines and redraw things until the profile looks right on a grind on a cardboard. So I put the knife down on some cardboard. I trace the lines of the bolster and the keyhole up to the terminus of the bolster metal and then I use like a ruler for a baseline and I kind of freehand sketch in the handle I want and that's what I've done here and then I finish drawing the handle all right like so got a nice little hook kind of a drop and then a, a long heel on the handle that's big enough for a, a ninja turtle grip for someone just a with a hand a little bit bigger than my own. So that's a good baseline for handle. And then what I've done is, and I think I learned this trick from Nick Wheeler. I'm not sure if it was original to him, but I'm pretty sure I got it from him. I kind of like it. Um, some people will use like plexiglass to make a handle pattern for the same reason, but all I've done is I've cut the handle out um, with an X-Acto knife. So what will be the wood block is this. But what that gives me is a negative here. And then look, I can place the negative on my block and play it around until I get the grain picture that I want. Because I might not want something, you know, that's like got all this unbalanced light colored stuff with a thing that almost looks like a crack in the middle of that. And then like too dark here or maybe, you know, I want to get more fancy grain than that. So I, I want some kind of compromise in the middle. I can play it around on both sides and see what I think both sides look like. Um, and in this case, I've gone with... I like the structure of the middle of this block the most. It's pretty well balanced. It's got this really nice kind of like... Uh, like embers glowing at night feel to it. It's a lot more black on this end, a lot more light on this end. So we're going to take and position the block so that... We're getting everything that's pretty in between tones, like this. I don't want to have a lot of light right in the point of the keyhole because uh, sometimes a glue line just won't look good there. You want to avoid a glue line, but you never know. It's better to have something a little darker toned. And um, yeah, I think this will do nicely. So it's a pretty tall handle profile, so we need to make sure we're not running out on either side. And then uh, we're getting the most patterned material that we can. And I think that's it right there. So I'm just going to mark that for now. And this is really just a placeholder of a mark. It's not definitive. This is just a reference for where we're going to set the actual knife bolster down on this block. 
So that creates a mark that can at least be seen. And then we'll go over that with a scribe, probably given that this is dark material. A scribe usually shows up really nice. You really want to use a scribe when you're marking out, when you're um, scribing the keyhole bolster onto your handle material. And not just any scribe. You can see this is a pretty regular carbide scribe. It's got a, easily a fine enough point for most work, but it's pretty blunt for getting a very accurate mark down, down through a, a material this tall. So I like to have a scribe, a tall, thin one, especially for this kind of work. And uh, let me just find it real quick. Where the heck I said it? Here we are. This is just a piece of 332nd stainless steel. And uh, I've ground it to a very fine point. Something bent it a little bit. I'll straighten that out. Yeah, give it a quick lick on the grinder just to get it sharp, sharp. And now we have a very nice fine point to reach down into that keyhole with. So we're going to set it to where we can see the pencil lines generated when we marked to our pattern. Yeah, there we go. I'll get it scooted on back a little bit. Yep, 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 yep. Okay, now you gotta hold it very, very tightly so that it doesn't move. Cause this needs to be real accurate. I go over my lines a few times and make sure that my scribe is at just the right angle. Okay, after a little fussing around, I was able to scribe a nice, clean, accurate keyhole and then rest of the handle. And I scribed the rest of the handle just a little bit oversized using the negative of the pattern here. Scribed it a little oversized. And I'm also gonna cut everything a little bit oversized because you wanna just kind of uh, be conservative in your material removal at any given point, unless you want to waste a whole block of wood and start over because you took too much off and the keyhole is loose. So there is what we're using for the handle right there. Now, this has been rough cut out on the bandsaw and it has been Trimmed on the belt grinder up close to the scribed line, but not quite to it all the way around. Uh, and then now we're going to check it to the block. Make sure that the scribed line is going to be accurate. And then we haven't taken too much off of anywhere. go so that's looking good now we're going to take some needle files and just give a little bitty chamfer all the way around until we're right up to our scribe line and then we'll be able to start pressing the bolster on and then taking it back off and removing a little material, etc., etc. 
So this inside curve gets a half round. The angle is going to be a little steep, greater than 45. And we want to begin being able to jam the block into that bolster and have it stick. If we don't chamfer it enough, or if our angle is too obtuse, then we'll never be able to get it started. I mean, this kind of stuff is too dicey to be doing with a grinder. It's so close to the line. From here on out, it's pretty much handwork. Definitely want to get it all because if you don't get it evenly, the areas that have been got less will kind of shove and bias the material towards the areas that are better chamfered and you'll get a little bit of a crooked start on your material. Okay, let's have a look and see how that is. Okay. That seems fairly decent there. Now, I'm going to go get my press that I use for this kind of stuff, and we'll start messing with that. Here you can see that I have started. I use a uh, Palmgren 4-inch heavy drill press vise, parallel jaws, to start pressing this wood into the bolster. Uh, it's slow and controllable and I don't want to exert too awful much force at a time the way that I do it anyway. But uh, ideally what you should be seeing, let me take you out of the tripod here, is uh, a little curl of wood there being shaved up by the edge of the tang which is broaching itself onto the wood all the way around. So we're going to do about that much. We're in there, uh, oh, 330 seconds or so, I would say. And we're going to tap it back out using a little block on top of the wood and uh, remove a little material ahead of uh, where this curl was and uh, try to shove it in again and uh, take it back out, et cetera, et cetera. So a little more of the process. We've worked our way down through somewhat. We're down to about there in the fit. You can see it was tearing a little bit when it let in. That's fairly typical. But uh, watch, I'll press it in again a little bit farther every time. Stabilized wood presses into the bolster a little different than non-stabilized. Non-stabilized works a little bit better, I think. Stabilized has this kind of like plasticized thing going on that causes the, the fibers to tear a little maybe. Yeah, watch this though. See that's pressing in? I like having this um, hand pressure drill press vise because it allows me to feel how much pressure I'm exerting. So it's getting a little tight there. Let's have a look. It's starting to be shoved most of the way through. And we're going to have to get it past, 
passed all the way through and a little bit to this side of the block because of our lead-in chamfer. That's going to make the fit look bad if we just left it flush here. But uh, it's looking good. When I hold it to a, a light source, which I can't really handily do in front of the camera right now, there's no light shining through from the other side of the block around the edges of the fit. So that's always good. And then let's look here. You can see there's little bits, not too much, but a little bit here, there, there, where it's still curling the material, still shaving up a little bit of wood as it goes through. So then I'll go take that and knock that apart. I just have the vise set apart enough that uh, I can get this tenon down in there to the point where the bolster is mostly supported. And then I will hold this block on top and have it. Have a little tap at it. Now we can see what work we have to do still. So a little bit to remove there and there. A little bit to remove there and there. You can see a little curl here. I'm going to mostly leave that alone because you really don't want to get the fit bad at this end, these ends. It really looks terrible. And so here, get that stuff out of the way. Just use a little leather pad here. And I'm just going to scrape. I'm going to find an area with a little curl like that. I'm going to scrape a little bit above it and a little bit below it. Because I figure a couple of things. One, the reason there was wood scraped up there is because up here above the existent curl is an area where the material was a little bit proud of the surrounding material and the broaching action of the bolster started to cut that material as it shoved across it so I'm going to actually scrape this a little bit that way it doesn't spring tension as you push the bolster through and then I'm going to scrape below it a little bit because I'm assuming that proud area extended below that curl somewhat on each one of these. And I'm not going to touch any areas that didn't get scraped. I'm using a, just a little wood carving chisel, but I'm not, I'm not actually chisel cutting with it. I'm scraping little curls of wood off with the edge of the blade close to 90 degrees to the material. If the blade is sharp, this has a mirror finish, then it actually has a nice, very glassy, controllable cut when you scrape with it. And then sometimes due to the orientation, I'll scrape vertically on the uh, round post of this tenon here. It's just less awkward to cut that direction. And let's look at the other side. Okay, right there. Sometimes if it's not scraping well and like chattering too much, sometimes just switching direction or changing the angle of the blade just a little bit will be enough to help it cut smoothly. Or you can alternate just to keep it from starting to chatter. Okay, so yeah, we wanna, the main thing is we wanna be conservative and then also like pinpoint with uh, our material removal. So let's go ahead and shove that in there again. See how far it gets, see how much tension it takes, see how much wood curls up and where. We're gonna start it lightly by hand every time, which we can because of that little chamfer on the leading edge of the wood. We're going to put it in here. Uh, try to center it up roughly so it's not pressing more on one side or the other. And uh, not like leaning the block as it pushes through. Uh, 
That's not taking a ton of pressure yet. Okay, we've come up farther this time. We're almost flush with the close side of the block. And then we'll go take and tap that out again, look for the curls, scrape it again, uh, add infinitum until we get all the way through to the point where the leading edge of the fit looks pretty good. Here's another kind of a fitting trick. So after you get the wood pressed all the way through to where it's starting to come out the opposite side of the tang metal, then you can't sho keep shoving it farther through with the vise as you have been because it just hits the front jaw and stops because the far side is flush. So what you need is like a bolster block of something else to keep to support the bolster metal while you're shoving the wood farther through. So I've used different things, like I've even formed metal for it, but all you really need is something that's solid enough that it's not going to get crushed or unduly bent or something. Uh, a flat block of something fairly thick. But it's also nice if it's, it's really easy to cut or machine, because what you need to do is trace this bolster, uh, the keyhole shape, onto your block of material for your press operation and then cut it out a little bit bigger so that you can push this through into there if you see what I'm saying. Okay. It supports the metal all the way around but it's a little loose on the wood. And this is nice, this is the UHMW plastic block. Very easy to band saw. I just used an end mill that was 5 8 This is a, a half inch um, end on this tenon. So I just use a 5 8 for oversize and trace this onto this and then cut it out oversize the bandsaw and finished it a little bit in the um, belt grinder keyhole grinding uh, platen setup and uh, away we go. So I've been able to push it quite a bit farther through. Um, and I can continue to do so if I want to. We are getting some little curls of material still being removed here in this area of the fit. So that's always good to see that it continues to cut a little bit because that means you're not shoving your way through into uh, narrower material. So probably knock this out one more time and uh, fit it back up and uh, et cetera, et cetera. Now I actually can start using this block for pushing the wood back out. Let's put the block on this side What's that going to do? Well, that's going to do what we want. Just put the, put the block on the opposite side. So that's pushed it back flush on this side, and then we'll go tap it out with that G10 block. Okay, so I shoved it back out and then uh, scraped it a little bit, shoved it back in again. Now I'm almost all the way through the block. I'll take one more little press, probably. And uh, it's a pretty good fit. Pretty good fit. I like it. You can see just a little bit of light there around the leading edge of it, but that won't be seen in the finished knife. And so I think we've reached the um, portion where all of the hand fitting is pretty much done for the actual keyhole and then we'll actually trim the excess width off this and, uh, and then we'll work some on drilling all the way down through this um, for our added tang because uh, let me reiterate the inside of this front front inside of this bolster has got a hidden tapped blind hole here for an added tang that's going to go all the way up through the handle and come out with a uh, Damascus nut or Damascus bolt head really on the end. So that's the next process to begin. So we have some material to trim away. And I'm gonna do that with the bandsaw on the thick side here. And I'm gonna do it with the belt grinder on the thin side here. Now, I'm just gonna leave it in here to do the bandsaw cut. And so I am going to make a mark 
with this. And I'm going to set that out to this distance right here and use that, use the scribe here to just quickly scratch a line to run the saw along outside that line. It's always real handy to use a scribe for stuff like that. As long as the surface of the block is flat, which this one is pretty flat as far as stabilized blocks go. We just need that because we're going to be looking at this while we cut it. The uh, This is going to be resting on the saw table. So now we're just going to fire up the bandsaw and uh, have a cut along that line. And hope no big uh, voids in the wood pop out at us. Well, that's it for this chapter, guys. Here's a look at the opposite side of the handle as trimmed. And uh, stay tuned for the next chapter, which should be the last in this series. It will show the fit-up of the handle with the added tang, and then it will show the finished knives. Thanks for staying with me this long, and we'll see you on the next one. And uh, Merry Christmas Eve.